For years, Lockie Whitfield has been a staple in our back lines across AFL, Fantasy, Dream Team, and Supercoach. But in 2024, it's fallen off the radar a little bit. Is that because he's passed his best? Or are we forgetting one of the best scoring options? Hello, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you are. Welcome back to another episode of the 50 Most Relevant. Number 38 today, Lockie Whitfield. A star of years gone by but maybe we'll get a few more seasons out of him yet. Joining me on this episode, for the first time we've collaborated with him, and if you've been on Twitter, podcasts, YouTube, chances are you've seen this man's beautiful face rolling around the community, getting in- involved. It's Mitch from the Ball Boys. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm good, MJ. Uh, Long time listener, first time uh, speaker. So very excited to make my 50 Most Relevant debut. And uh, I've got a very interesting player to talk about today in Lockie Whitfield, who I think uh, maybe doesn't quite get the discussion he might deserve, uh, at least this preseason. I totally agree with you. Let's look back at his 2023 season. He's coming in priced at 519000 for us in Supercoach. That's off the back of a 92.9 in Supercoach. Seven tons last year. A 141 was the career high for the season. But really, the career high is a monster 170. So your boy's got some ceiling. In AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, an average of 94.7 means he's priced in those two formats. In AF, just over 850000 and a touch over 870,000 in Dream Team. Nine tons last year, a season high of 134 and a career high score of 190. Mitch, there's not too many players in AFL that when you just watch them, when you own them in your team, there are certain players that induce this great feeling of adulation and excitement because you know within a two-minute window, they can score you 30 points on the other side. It's just a nerve-wracking moment because that injury history, which I'm sure we'll get to in a moment, just has you feeling that with every tackle, every burst of speed as he's surging away from opponent, you're going, please let the strings hold intact. He's an amazing player to watch and a fun player to own too. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you know, you talk about ceiling and things like that. If you have a player that can reach in NFL fantasy the the heights of one hundred and ninety on any given night, um, but on the flip side, he can, you know, he's obviously had a few early injuries in games in the past. So there's a there's a wide range of outcomes when you're watching a, a Lockie Whitfield game. But it it does still come back to the fact that this guy is a freak of a talent. He's had multiple years of you know top tier um, fantasy production in multiple different positions, forward, midfield defender positions as well. We can pick him as a defender this season. So um, if you weren't considering Lockie Whitfield because of maybe this is injury history or you've sort of, you know, put him out of your mind, I would definitely encourage everyone to at least, you don't have to pick him, but I think you should at least consider the possibility that he might be a good starting pick for your fantasy or super coach teams to begin the year. It's amazing to me, isn't it, in in the community? Sometimes we build this false narrative around a player, and we'll get to this injury history in a moment. I know you've done some work for us on this episode to look into that a little bit. But we look at players and we go, yeah, nah, we discount them. And the beauty of January and February especially is we should be looking at all the variables, all the possibilities, all the structure and player makeups, and not just going, this is my team, I'm done. But no, use the time to be able to do that. If we dive into this 2023 data a little bit more, in AFE average, 94.7, nine tons, a couple of them over 120, and just the two scores under 80. Pre-buy, he goes at a 90.9. That's enough in AFL fantasy and dream team to be knocking on the door of a top 10 10 defender. However, in the final eight games of last year, 100.8 is is his average and certainly one of the best defenders to have owned on the run home. And really, that's when the GWS Giants really got cracking and surged towards finals. In Supercoach, 92.9, seven tons. So also two scores over 120. A little bit more scoring variance, five under 80 a pre-buy average of 84, but a post-buy average really surging it of 107.1. There are two things I want to unpack with you about, um, about him. One is around a narrative that he has lost his ceiling. Okay, maybe the 190 might not be there, but as you said, anyone that can do it, you want to look at. He's got multiple 130s last year. So to me, the ceiling conversation feels a little moot. But the big one that I think probably rules people out of him is 
He's got a terrible injury history. What's your take on the injury history narrative of Lockie Whitfield? Well, I want to attack this from a two different point of view. One that, that's specific to Lockie Whitfield and one that's like, I guess, a um, an attitude towards players who've had injuries in the past in general because, um, and I'm going to reference a, a fantasy basketball legend, Australian legend podcaster, Josh Lloyd, that, you know, in my opinion, is a very good way to surmise it very succinctly. You're injury prone until you're not, and you're an Iron Man until you're not. And we saw that in a very famous example. Example, I want to bring up a player different to Lockie Whitfield who had a similar kind of injury history before last season in Tim English, who prior to last season had identical uh, games played as a Lockie Whitfield in the previous four seasons in a row. And we know what happened to Tim English last season. He came on and played every single game and was the leading AFL fantasy scorer for the season. So if you were having a similar attitude to someone like a Tim English, who had the exact same amount of games played as a Lockie Whitfield, and you faded him in the start of the year because he's injury prone, well, then you, by most accounts, probably had a you know pretty miserable season because he, uh, he definitely made you pay for it. So that's not to say that they're exact same player, but just in general, ruling someone out because previous years they haven't played all 23 games or whatever it is. I think that that can lead to, you know, you know, quickly ruling someone out when you, you should be paying more attention. But when it comes to Whitfield in particular, and when I assess a player and give them an injury prone label or, or something that we need to deduct them for, the most important thing to me, well, there's two main things, their age and Whitfield is, you know, he's getting a little bit older, but he's still only 29 years old. He's not in his thirties just yet. And the other thing is uh, something that continually pops up, whether it's a reoccurring uh, groin injury or they've had multiple, you know, torn hamstrings or anything like that. And for Lockie Whitfield, in the most instances, it's it always seems to be just these random, most unlucky injuries, whether it's a concussion, whether it's something, um, I think he was sick one year, or there was a, a really weird rib injury, or it's, it always seems to be something different, which for me, who you know has a little bit of a, an exercise um, science background, those things don't necessarily add to the increased risk of him re-injuring another something different. Now, if he, you know, was constantly injuring his, you know, his his groin or his hamstring or something like that. And and recently, that's something that I would definitely take into account. But for Lockie Whitfield, for the most part, it is just these random injuries. So I don't think that assuming he has a good, healthy preseason, that we should necessarily come into the season expecting, oh, he's going to miss six games. He's going to miss five games this year. Because like we saw with Tim English last season, he might not. And you might miss out on a really good pick because of that. Yeah, it's a really great take, Mitch. The fact that he missed two games last year. One was a suspension. The other, he got concussed. So neither of those can really feed you into an injury-prone narrative. There's, I think he had an appendix removed like one year, like super random. Like if there was, if you're playing operation, he has had pretty much every single one of the injuries that you could experience in a player. He's one of the safest 90 plus historical defenders that we could see. He hasn't gone under 90 since 20. 17 and just one seasonal average under 92 in super coach. He was a top 10 defender for us last year by average in AF and a top 15 defender for us in super coach. And so even with a, a season where he just flew under the radar for us, he's still finding a way to get it done. But as we turn towards 2024, and that's what we've got to do, the past can only inform future decisions. It, it's an indicator, but not the decider about what will or won't happen. GWS have an interesting early run of fixtures. They do play an opening round and do get that early buy. I'll unpack that with you in a moment. But when we're starting with a player at his price point, Mitch, we want to see significant premium scoring early and definitely overperforming what we're paying for. He did it for us at the back of last year. What do you see in this early fixture of the Giants to give us some, some confidence or some potential concern to either fade or elevate where we should be looking him? in our starting squads. So, yeah, I think when it comes to picking your premiums, you do want them. Now, I try not to take it as much into account as during the season because, obviously, you're picking a guy in round one. You're hoping to have them, especially at a premium price for the entire season. But if they start really, really well and start with a bang, it can be very difficult for other teams to get on board because their price is going to rise. And if he is a unique player, he can stay unique for you for a longer time. So 
Um, first two rounds for fantasy are about as good as they get for for defenders, midfielders, for whatever he, he does, which is a lot of different positions. Uh, North Melbourne and West Coast in round one and two. So you've got basically the most favorable matchups for a player like Whitfield who gets into space, gets a lot of the ball. Um, you know, those North and West Coast teams, I think, will allow him to do that. He does then have his bye, but immediately after his bye, he's got the Gold Coast Suns. New Dimmer Hardwick coached over there. We've seen him allow you know, halfbacks to rack up a lot of fantasy points in the past and then St. Kilda. So another team that, again, halfbacks feast on. We have a lot of, um, you know, records from last year to say that they get a lot of points. So those first four games out of the five weeks are basically as good of a run as a defender you can get before he then comes up against Carlton, which is essentially the first quote-unquote difficult matchup which we'll have for the season. So if you compare him to someone like uh, a Nick Dacos, for example, who was another popular player premium who has that early buy. It, to me, it's night and day when it comes to their run. And you obviously can get Whitfield a bit cheaper and the run is a little bit better when you don't necessarily have to worry about Finn McGinnis tag or, or anything like that. And and even if there is a tag coming towards GWS Giants, I don't think it's going to Whitfield anymore. I think Tom Green has sort of taken that mantle or a Josh Kelly, whereas Whitfield has kind of left to do his own thing. Um, and when you're up against players where the Giants should comfortably handle, I think that Whitfield is someone that definitely can get on the end of that and score big points for us. I really love that summary. I think the beautiful thing that I think the coaches that are playing all formats of fantasy footy are, are opening their minds up through January to the possibilities of how to approach opening round. When we first got the information that it was best 18 and while we might get a scoring bunk from opening round players, we kind of looked first thought very common ideology in the community was premiums. Don't start them, jog on, look elsewhere. But with time, it does give us an opportunity to look at a little bit more nuance. We unpacked this a few days ago on the 50 most relevant with Rids as we talked about Tim Taranto. One of the things that you've just highlighted is the beautiful ceiling matchups that are early there for Lockie Whitfield. And yet we miss him in an early round that's not ideal. However, this is a great time of the year too where if it's only best 18, man, check where he plays in that round. You don't have to lock that trade in away Thursday night, so to speak, you can actually go, all right, have I got some cash cows? Have I got some of my mid-price guys? If they pop a Cade Chandler, Nick Martin type ton early in the week, all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I can still hold this premium through there. So what's your take on this idea of looking at all the nuances and rather than just being so black and white around opening around? Because I, I feel like it's an interesting conversation the community needs to keep having. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's it's unprecedented in a way. Like we we don't like I can sit here and say this in my thoughts, but I could be very wrong, you know. And and it's I think it's important to know that you know we're all kind of discovering the right strategy on the fly. So I do think like limiting your amount of early buy around players is you know it makes sense. There's logic to it, but on the same you know, side of things like you could look at the ownership percentages in a lot of the formats right now and look and see that a Sam Flanders is pretty high up there. And he too has an early round by the exact same buy round as a Lockie Whitfield. And I don't know if a lot of coaches out there would have actually compared the two players because they're different positions. You know, there's different set of circumstances, but if you're going to pick a round three buy player, have you looked at Sam Flanders versus a uh, Lockie Whitfield and, and look uh, beyond the position, look beyond the price tag as well. So, um, you know, like I said before, if you've got a Nick Dacos in your team, I think it's important not to load up on lots of those players, but we do have the ability to at least have one, maybe two in each of our lines so that we have the ability to cover them when those buy rounds come up. And I do think it is important to, you know, make sure that you're not just limiting yourself to what's on their line and look at team wide, how many players you have on that early buy around possible. So you can navigate those early buys, um, you know, as agile as, as you possibly can. And uh, yeah, I just think that we need to continue to look at other possibilities, you know, sideways trades. It's always a little bit of a dirty word, but you know, if there is smooth sailing with the fact that we can seal these rookies in the early buy that round zero, maybe we don't have to do as much, rookie fix-ups in the early buy rounds. That's that's a possibility. We might have a bit more freedom to do some of these, um, you know, trading in a player coming off their buy and trading a guy who's got their buy and those kind of things. I wouldn't rule out the possibility. It is maybe something that we haven't done in the past, but doesn't mean it won't work this season. 
I think that's beautifully articulated for us around the the idea of how we unpack and look at this new season. While people that have played fantasy footy for a long period of time might remember early teams being off buys, doing best 18, opening round, getting the the loading of the price movement from those games. This is a new year for us, not just in terms of players' availabilities, but in terms of and who's in which line. But the strategies of what we walk into 2024 do have some new nuances that none of us have done before. And there's going to be plenty of learnings, plenty of mistakes, and plenty of successes that come along the way. Much of the preseason, and probably to be fair, much of the 40s of the 50 most relevant was really targeted at the forward line, really waving the big red flag. It's a painful line. Hunting value is important. And how much can you trust these top end premiums was certainly a big piece of the conversation. And while the pain in the forward line, ask anyone that's done a draft rank, they'll be like, it's worse than you realize. But our back lines haven't exactly been untouched. We've lost three really important players that were really relevant last year in Jordan Dawson, Will Day, and Sam Doherty. They're all out. And then I know it's probably a little tongue-in-cheek, but you can build a narrative to poke some holes in a bunch of different defenders. Does Sicily get as much ball with a maturing and improving Hawthorne? Does the mooted move to the midfield of Tom Stewart, which I don't think will happen, but that's fine. Does the move to the midfield cap his ceiling? Does Dacos get absolutely clamped early in the year with matches against Hawthorne, Port Adelaide and Sydney? Can Sheasel even play back? Does he become the centre forward player that saves their team's goal scoring opportunities? The Saints really didn't work last year. And does the Sinclair and Naziah Wangani Miller combo even work with now a show and maker potentially an even bigger and stronger ball user? Does Shane Scott in this score in this new Richmond system? Can the monopoly of Luke Ryan continue on? Will Hayden Young score in the midfield more than a back four weeks of the year that really didn't count for Fremantle? I'm no one being deliberately facetious in, in poking the holes, but Mitch, we spent a lot of time drawing the concerns in the forward lines, but not enough time actually looking at what we might need to do in the defensive line, which is why, as you mentioned just earlier, Lockie Whitfield is a seriously important player to consider. Yeah, 100%. A lot of the time we can fall into the trap of looking at last year's average and just assuming that they're going to do the same thing again. But like like you said, you look at you know someone like a James Sicily and he's priced at 104 and you know the natural thing is to think, oh, yep, he's going to be the top two or three defenders. But historically, he's been a mid-90s player. Um, you know, and he, I think he, I did a, a stat the other day that Sicily, he's, he's averaged the most amount of marks of any defender or any player in the last 11 years and was only one of two players that averaged over nine marks per game. And he nearly did 10. So a player like that, I think you can see regression. Someone like a Luke Ryan, you mentioned as well. He's someone who, you know, that was his, I think, believe he was his career high year in terms of AFL fantasy scoring. So a lot of these players, we like to sort of think they can continue doing what they're doing, get better, but for the, for the most realistic take, it, it usually is, you know, some of these guys are going to regress. And when you have, um, you know, a lot of question marks about outside of maybe that top one defender, who's going to be the next best or the third best in, in that line, someone who has the ceiling, the early run that a lot of Whitfield does definitely needs to be in consideration. Um, and I will also, I, would, I just want to mention as well that, when Lockie Whitfield was firing on all cylinders in the Giants days where way they were up and about, they made the finals in, in 2019. He was at his best and he was at his best when the team was performing really well. And it also highlighted again, what happened at the end of last year when the Giants really started to get on a roll. They only lost two games um, before the finals after their bye. And that's where you brought up before that Whitfield was dominating in terms of scoring. So if we think that the Giants are going to, you know, continue their form of, you know, team play as they, as they did in the back half of last season, which I do think will be the case. They started to really play some really good footy. I think that that serves in favor of someone like Whitfield, who seems to really take advantage of those big team wins and gets on the back of a lot of possessions. And when you start the year with North Melbourne and, and West coast, there's a lot of uh, lopsided scores that I think can go in the favor of Lockie Whitfield. So I do think that, you know, it seems a little while ago, but some of those ceiling seasons that like we've put up, you know, back in the Giants glory days, they might not be too far away um, as we might think compared to the most recent few seasons. In a line that we've got lots to ponder and maybe haven't, it's early January, given enough thought to, 
He gives us an element of safety and security. One of the most reliable 90 plus defenders across the formats going around for the past five, six, seven seasons. Does he have ceiling still in him? Absolutely. Multiple 130 plus scores. Does he have value potentially and built into him? Well, we mentioned the contrast of seasonal average of that mid 90s to low 90s versus the 100 in AF and DT and the 107 in Supercoach over those final eight weeks of the year. And then as Mitch has beautifully brought to the table, this early fixture gives us an opportunity for all these elements to come together to be able to select him with an element of confidence. If nothing else, Lockie Whitfield needs to be on your short list. If nothing else, he needs to be someone you're considering at D1, D2, D3, depending on how deep and heavy you want to roll with premium defenders this year. He's absolutely someone you should consider, if nothing else. And by the way, the injury history, eh, it's not as bad. It's not as prone as you might think. Before we wrap up the episode with Mitch, let's talk about drafts. Where do you see him going on draft? I know you play more AFL fantasy draft and a super coach player as well, but where do you see him going on draft day for us? So I look at the defense and I think that, you know, despite, you know, I've, you know, in my podcast, I've said that I wouldn't probably start with Nick Dacos. I still am very comfortable saying that he is by far and away the top defender. So he's D1, I think, in a lot of, lot of situations. I still think that someone like a Sinclair is up there as well. But as soon as I get past those two names, someone like a Lockie Whitfield to me comes into consideration. I think he's in that tier of a bunch of players that can average sort of the high 90s. Maybe if things go their way, they can crack the 100. So I've got him in and amongst players like Sicily, players like uh, a Harry Sheasel, a Tom Stewart. Um, I don't really know what's going on with Nick Newman and the return of Zach Williams and whether that affects him. But he's he's in that group of, of players, I think, there. So he's definitely someone's D1 in a draft uh, as opposed to, you know, anything lower. As as it comes to the top of the 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 rankings for for defenders, I think he's right towards that three to six range in terms of overall defender rankings for me. And um, yeah, I think it's it's someone you definitely need to um, have a look for. And you might be able to get him at value on drafts because of that perceived injury risk that a lot of teams might have. And his average is a little bit below some of those other guys. But I do think that he can challenge a player like a Sisley, uh, for example. Yeah, I really like that take. I think in Supercoach, he probably slides back maybe a, a defensive spot to a D2. But if you want to attack the draft heavy with locking away one of those premium rocks or get deep into the mids early, there's no problem with me going for him at a D1 in a Supercoach draft too on the premise that you've locked away some of those bigger or gone deeper and longer into those spots. So I think that's a, a fair take. Mitch, you've been an absolute superstar. It's been great to do this episode with you. Tell us a little bit about the Ball Boys, where they can get your podcast and also watch your episodes as well. Yeah, mate, uh, you can find uh, you find us, Ball Boys AFL Fantasy, on YouTube. We've got a YouTube channel over there. Go and uh, subscribe if you like the visual performance. I know my hair is not quite up to the scratch of yours, mate, but uh, oh, I try to, try, try to follow <laughs> example. Uh, but, yeah, you can find us there or on podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. And uh, if you're into fantasy basketball as well, NBA fantasy, you can also check out a little bit of stuff that I do over there at Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball, trying to wear two hats this time of year uh keeps me busy but it's also very enjoyable with lots of different uh lots of different things to talk about mate you're a superstar thanks so much for joining us on this episode buddy thank you so much mate thanks for having me if you want to go through if you're like you just listed all these things i'm going to check out good news we'll put it in the description of this episode so if you're like what's that video what's that nba thing i'm down for that where do i get in touch with him on x we've got your cover just go to the description of this episode you'll be able to check that out and then all the other links you need for the coaches panel to our patreon all our social media you can find in the description of this episode we are nearing kind of a third of the way through the 50 most relevant. Can you believe it? We're almost into the mid thirties. Tomorrow we hit number 37. Who is he? Let me give you a little bit of a clue in 30 seconds time. But if you are loving what you're getting from the coaches panel this preseason, I encourage you to make sure you follow us across all social media, become a Patreon member and leave a five-star rating and review on our Whatever podcast platform you choose to do, we would love to be able to include you into the coaches panel family in that way. Uh, all the details of those things, like I said just moments ago, are in the description of this episode. So who's at number 37? It's a player that couldn't have had 
in many people's eyes, an off season that would make us completely uninterested in him. Just they've gone, you know what? One thing happened and they went, nah, I'm done. But he's been a multi-year 120 performer in Supercoach. A multi-year 110 performer in AF and DT. But how far back in his history were those big numbers? And is there enough things that's happened in the off season? And there are enough premiums in that line now where you go, you know what? He was good back then. But despite some things changing, I've got no interest in him. He's pretty relevant to me, no matter what you think. Who is he? Find out tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant.